Um, in 2014, in the middle of 2014, a letter was written to the Prime Minister and the Secretary of State for Health from several leading doctors, including the, current, that, the then President of the Royal College of Physicians, Sir Richard Thompson, and the past Chair of the Royal College of General Practitioners, Claire Gerarda, basically objecting to the fact that our guideline body, National Institute of Health and Care Excellence, NICE, had actually come out with a statement saying that essentially most, if not all, people over the age of 50 should be offered statins and prescribed. And ultimately that would lead to a financial incentive for GPs as well. So this came out, um, several of us weren't happy with that, so we wrote a letter and we got media attention around it as well to get this message out there. And what some, there was a lot of points in that letter, you can look it up, there's quite a lot of detail in it, but we pointed out that a lot of this guidance was based upon industry-sponsored data. Several members of the guideline development group on the panel that made this recommendation had direct financial ties to pharma companies sponsoring statins, either their, institutional, uh, their institutions were getting funding from pharma companies. And they didn't take into account significant side effects, including type 2 diabetes. And the other aspect, which is most important, is when you look at the independent data anyway, which we had data on, that people at low risk, otherwise healthy people, have no mortality benefit from taking statin. You're not going to live one day longer. So we thought that this, you know, this would ultimately potentially cause more harm than any good that it could do for the population. And this, again, is really extraordinary. And I'm still, when I talk about this, and I've spoken about this a few times, it still shocks me. Very recently, very respected, reputed French cardiologist at Grenoble University, independent researcher, very good with statistics. He's done his own analysis at major, of major statin trials, essentially all industry-sponsored trials. And he has concluded that it's possible that nobody benefits from statins, even people with established heart disease. And there was a story on the front page of the Sunday Express not so long after this was published, and he actually was quoted as saying, we cannot trust these trials, I would warn people not to take statins. Now I'm not saying that, but the fact that somebody such as him, who's no conflict of interest, has no reason to do this, comes out with that statement. And you can look up this article online, it's a very compelling read, it's about 20 pages. Um, you know, he points out lots of discrepancies in different studies. He points out really flagrant conflicts of interest, including statisticians on the payroll of industry that, you know, wouldn't be acceptable today in terms of their, you know, their, them being involved in analyzing data. So it's a very compelling case, and we don't have access to what we call the raw data. Now, this is a really, one of the reasons, when I was coming to Australia to speak, this is something that's been really a bugbear for me for a while. Um, as many of you know, in May last year, the Medical Journal of Australia published a paper saying that as a result of an ABC Catalyst statin program, which Marion de Massey was involved in, up to 2,900 people may have suffered a heart attack or died as a result of stopping their medication. I looked at that paper in detail when it came out, when the press release came out, and I can tell you now that it was, in my view, it was grossly misleading at best, and there is not a single shred of evidence that one person, one person has suffered a heart attack or died because of that program. And actually, on the contrary, what I would say is that because of that program, it opened our eyes. Marianne's already said at the beginning it was factually, factually correct. You know, it was a brilliant piece of journalism I shared it with so many influential doctors who thought it was fantastic. It, in fact, inspired many people to look more critically at the data, further journal publications on this whole issue that's happened since then. And that was because of Marion de Massey's program. So she has been an inspiration behind this. And she, you know, what, the, what she went through over here, I was absolutely appalled by. In fact, I was actually supposed to go on live on ABC News 24 when all of this story broke out from London via Skype. But for whatever reason, half an hour before, and I would have said the same things I'm telling you now, um, about half an hour before that interview was unfortunately cancelled. But I'm saying for the public record now, brilliant journalism inspired us. Even Sir Richard Thompson, um, the past president of the Royal College of Physicians and Queen's doctor, actually said that she correctly questioned the lack of transparency, which we still have on this patient data and commercial trials and that an independent review on the scientific basis of statins is now required. So I think Marianne deserves a real round of applause for that. So how has this all happened? Well, there's some basic things I think we need to understand. The pharmaceutical companies actually, and the, and the device companies, have a fiduciary obligation as businesses to make a profit. 
and declare a shareholder dividend. But what many people don't realize is they don't actually have a legal responsibility to give you the best treatment, despite the fact most of us would believe that or want that to be the case. But the real scandals are the fact that regulators fail to prevent misconduct by industry, and that doctors, institutions, and journals that have responsibilities to patients and scientific integrity collude with industry for financial gain. We talk about innovative drugs. What's the reality of that innovation? Marcia Angel, former editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, looked at, of the 667 drugs that were approved by the FDA between 2000 and 2008, only 11% of them were truly innovative. 75% that came on the market that have been utilized across the population were actually copies of old ones. And drug companies, maybe it's not surprising, they spend twice as much on marketing than they do actually on research and development. And what does she say? The former editor of the number one impact medical journal in the world. It is no longer possible to trust much of the clinical research that is published or to rely on the judgment of trusted physicians or authoritative medical guidelines. I take no pleasure in this conclusion, which I reached slowly and reluctantly over my two decades as an editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. Richard Horton, editor of The Lancet, is she a lone voice? No. He wrote in an ed online editorial last year at a meeting that he had um, been at that essentially, um, with, with some very respected scientists that he didn't name, that up to possibly half of the published literature is false. And we've had several recent scandals in the UK, including universities failing to deal with research misconduct when it happens. And the former editor of the British Medical Journal, Richard Smith, has actually called for statutory regulation. And he said something is rotten in the state of British medicine and has been for a long time. 